Peace, everybody. It's your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. We are here tonight talking about some explosive news that has come out in the media. It's been happening all day. It started yesterday. It really started earlier this week when Diddy uh, received uh, that paperwork from Cassidy, excuse me, from Cassie. Uh, Cassie uh, filed paperwork in court charging Diddy with sexual misconduct, sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape, uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking, all the stuff. Uh, they quickly settled out of court within uh, less than 48 hours, in fact. Um, and many people thought that that was the high point of the week, that we would see that case come and go. But it's been a hell of a day. Since then, we have seen so many other things come up. Now, first, it was uh, Harvey Pierre. For those that don't know Harvey Pierre, if y'all grew up watching Making the Band, y'all probably saw Harvey Pierre on Making the Band. Uh, Harvey Pierre is an executive. He was he went to Howard with uh, Diddy. He's the, he was at one point the president of Bad Boy Records. Uh, he was somebody who uh, is known in the industry and in the business uh, again as the president of Bad Boy Records, a longtime record exec, exec. and he received some paperwork that got filed today. Uh, and I'm going to read it specifically uh, from People Magazine. They they obtained some documents where a Jane Doe plaintiff, that means that we don't know the person's actual identity. She alleges that Harvey Pierre, a longtime executive of Bad Boy Records, used his position of authority to groom, exploit, and sexually assault her. This is her allegation. And again, these are all allegations. I say that not to disparage the victim. I don't say they're all allegations as a way of denying their legitimacy. I'm simply speaking in legal terms. They are allegations and everyone is entitled to a day in court. Uh, but these allegations are serious uh, and they feel consistent. And so this woman sued Harvey Pierre uh, and uh, also sued Bad Boy Records, also sued uh, Sean, Sean, Com Sean Combs Entertainment. She's decided to sue uh, multiple parties related both to him as a person, but also Bad Boy as a record label. Um, why would someone do this? I mean, it's a, it, it's the right question. Are we there? Can y'all hear me? Okay, I think we locked up for just a half a second, but we back now. We back, we back, we back. So look, as a matter of fact, y'all, you know what I'm going to do? No, nah, I'm not going to do that. I was about to start the stream over, but I don't want no problems. I don't want to lose y'all. So what I'm going to do is just keep rocking. Um. She sued this Jane Doe and sued uh, Harvey Pierre, Bad Boy Entertainment, Bad Boy Records, and Combs Enterprises as co-defendants, saying that she uh, that they were involved in gender motivated violence and negligence. Their lawsuit says defendants failed to properly supervise Pierre, properly supervise plaintiff, and protect plaintiff from a known danger. And that's that's some powerful language. A known danger, and thereby enabled Pierre's sexual assaults of plaintiff so they're basically saying that there was a reckless environment there and in the aftermath of diddy's lawsuit and the details of that 35 page document their lawyers harvey pierre the, the, the plaintiff's lawyers who sue in harvey pierre uh have uh at least a reasonable argument again i don't know what happened i wasn't there but i do know that legally they're in or strategically they're in a, a strong legal position so uh, that's based on attorneys I've spoken to. That's based on uh, other civil suits that we've seen. It's a very interesting space for them to be in. So we just going to say that and leave that there. Um, what else is happening, though? Because that didn't even make the headlines. I told y'all what we're going to be talking about. Harvey Pierre didn't even make the headlines. Why? Because today we've seen an outbreak of numerous uh, lawsuits for sexual misconduct. And I'm using sexual misconduct because it's a very broad uh, a label that encompasses lots of stuff. Let's start with Axel Rose. Axel Rose is accused, and this lawsuit was filed today, Wednesday, November 22nd. Wednesday, November 22nd, Axel Rose um, is accused by a known plaintiff. This isn't an anonymous, this isn't a Jane Doe. Actress and model uh, Sheila Kennedy, she says that he assaulted and raped her in his hotel room. 
this lawsuit again was filed today and she says that in new york in a lawsuit uh in a lawsuit she says that in new york he he engaged in a kind of brutal uh, uh, sexual assault, and I, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the gritty details. And forgive me, if, you know, if this is too uh, triggering for some of you or too gruesome for some of you. You know, come back. We'll be having a different conversation later. We'll be talking about some stuff going on in American politics. But for now, I do want to talk about this because this is an important piece of our culture. When I say our culture, I mean American culture. This idea of sexual violence, this idea of a reemerging Me Too movement, although it hasn't gone anywhere. I'm talking about all of this stuff. So this woman, Sheila Kennedy says that uh axel rose and if you don't know axel rose some of y'all might be too young or too not into rock music to know axel rose but axel rose was the front man the lead singer of guns and roses appetite for destruction one of the great albums of the decade use your illusion one and two other great albums great artists and of course slash a black man is the, is the is the other main part of that that crew but axel rose has some messy history he has some messy uh, stories surrounding him. We've heard the stories of racism. We've heard the stories of drugs. We've heard the stories of uh, of wanton recklessness. Well, this woman says that she liked Axl Rose and she was attracted to him and that she probably was interested in having sex with him. But at some point over the course of the night, he became violent and angry. And she said she saw him mixing alcohol with cocaine and prescription pills. And after seeing all of that, she didn't want no parts of Axl Rose. That's what this woman says. She says that um, he started messing with another model uh, and uh, Ricky Rackman, who's like an MTV personality, I don't know if y'all know, uh, and another model. And uh, at some point, after assaulting one person, he then became angry at her and assaulted her. This woman is alleging, I'm not going to get into all the, the gritty details, but he says that Rose would physically uh, assault her, sexually assault her, did not use a condom, she did not consent. She said she felt, quote, overpowered. She, quote, she felt she had no escape or exit and was compelled to acquiesce. This is the woman's claim. This is heavy stuff, y'all. This is Axel Rose. This is from 1989. The Harvey Pierre stuff uh, alleges that he groomed a woman uh, and sexually assaulted her in 2016 and 2017. That's one of the more recent cases. We're talking about going back just seven, six or seven years, but still not what we call a new case. This is making my head spin as, as we're reading and I'm trying to catch up and I'm trying to keep track of all these stories. Again, I was just going to come on here and talk about Harvey Pierre. And then I found out that so many other people have been accused of stuff. And then we heard Jimmy Iovine. Now, if you don't know Jimmy Iovine, you're probably not connected to the music business because Jimmy Iovine is one of the most powerful uh people uh in the music business we you may of you know him as the co-founder of interscope records somebody who's responsible for dr dre somebody who's responsible for eminem somebody who's responsible for 50 cent eminem dre who else i mean going down the list right uh kevin kendrick right on some level well he's being sued for sexual misconduct and sexual abuse again this one is a jane doe saying that he sexually abused forcibly touched and subjected to sexual harassment and retaliation this woman in August of 2007. Now, some of you might be saying, why is all this happening now? I'm gonna answer that in one in one second. You are, you're asking, why would all these famous people be getting sued at the same time on the same day for similar charges? It's a fair question, it's the right question. We're gonna answer that question for you. Um, but I need you, first of all, to hit the subscribe button, hit the subscribe button, Hit the like button if you're engaged in this conversation, if you want to know why this is happening. My job is not to report celebrity gossip. You can go to celebrity gossip sites for that. My job here is to give you a thorough analysis of why this is happening. Why is Bill Cosby and Diddy and Harvey Pierre and Jimmy Iovine and Axl Rose all being sued for sexual misconduct of various forms in the same week this is a question that we have to ask this is a question that we have to answer and i promise you i will answer it but stay with me hit the like button hit the subscribe button if you want to be part of the mlh family hit the join button you can go all the way from bronze to diamond and it allows you to support this platform and support the work that we do to help me build independent uh media platforms that create radical possibilities political education uh unbought and unbossed analysis somebody said uh, how are you equipped to analyze these issues my job is not in this context to analyze and break down 
with uh, scholarly expertise uh, or, or legal expertise these cases. I'll defer to the lawyers. I'll defer to the scholars of these matters. What I am going to do, um, what I am going to do is talk about uh, as a as a cultural critic what this moment means and what we should be looking out for, how we should be thinking about this. There's lots of stuff I don't have expertise in, on. Um, I'm going to analyze what this moment means. I'm not going to analyze the individual cases. I think those cases need to be analyzed by legal experts. I think they need to be unpacked in court. And I think people need to get their day their day in court. But I certainly have the capacity as someone who talks and thinks about race and gender and identity uh, to have this conversation. So if you don't think that, if you don't agree, that's cool too. Just roll out. You know what I mean, you ain't got to be part of this conversation. Um, you always have that opportunity. If you disagree, you're working away in the comments. I'll even respond to you. Um, so let's go. Is that my Zionist? Is that my Zionist stand? You said I don't know if it's a Zionist. I don't know if it's a stand. I don't know any of that stuff. I just know people be on here saying all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so in addition to those names, the next thing I see is Jamie Foxx. Now I gotta say the Jamie Foxx one surprised me for multiple reasons, um, and we found out that a lawsuit was filed on Monday implicating Jamie Foxx for sexual assault and battery charges in a lawsuit that was filed, again, in New York State Supreme Court. This woman, also a Jane Doe, claims in the suit that Jamie Foxx intentionally and without consent used force to offensively touch the plaintiff's person, that means her body, including groping her breasts and genitals. So this was unwanted touching. Again, this is unwanted touching is absolutely a form of sexual violence. It's absolutely a form of sexual assault. Again, I'm not saying Jamie Foxx did it or didn't do it. I'm not making any claims about any of these people. Again, these are just allegations, uh, and I don't have the ability. No one of none of us has the, none of us has the ability unless we were there to say what happened. But what we can say is that these are very serious allegations that we all should um, grant the seriousness that they merit. Um, she says that. Uh, Jamie Foxx seemed intoxicated at the time of the incident. She says that because of this unwanted touching, because of the un non-consensual uh, groping uh, of her breasts and genitals, that she suffered, quote, physical and emotional injuries, anxiety, distress, embarrassment, and economic harm. Again, the plaintiff isn't just suing Jamie Foxx, they're also suing the restaurant's parent company, Catch Hospitality Group. Ah, uh, uh, Catch. I know Catch. Catch is a restaurant in New York. This happened in the restaurant Catch in New York City, which I know very well. Many of you know very well if you live in New York or, or spend time um, in New York. So this is the context. Jamie Foxx is in here now. Again, sexual violence is a broad uh, framework. Sexual assault is a broad term. Um, and so what Jamie Foxx is being accused of is very different than what, say, Axl Rose is being accused of. It's very different than what, say, Harvey Pierre is being accused of, but all of them are being accused of this stuff. And I'm going to throw one more in here. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr. And, and again, we already talked about Jimmy Iovine. Again, Jimmy Iovine, Interscope chair, head, um, is accused of sexual abuse, forcible touching, and sexual harassment retaliation. Don't want, I don't want to leave that one out. But I want to bring up Cuba Gooding Jr. for a very specific reason as well because this is a Cuba Gooding Jr.'s second lawsuit on this matter, on, on such a matter, excuse me. Uh, not the same matter, but different matters. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. is facing two new lawsuits from women who claim that he groped them in separate incidents at New York restaurants in 2018 and 2019. The lawsuits were filed on Wednesday in New York uh, Supreme Court, uh, and they, uh, they go along with another suit that came this past June with a woman who accused Cuba Gooding Jr. of rape in 2013. Um, but in the 20, uh, the more recent cases, uh, there's a cocktail rate waitress at a Lavo restaurant and nightclub in New York who says that uh, he forcibly kissed her, he put his tongue in her mouth without consent. Uh, and then there's another one in 2022 uh, where, well, you know, let's not even do it. it, it there's not another one in 2022, let me restate that. In 2022, there is a transcript from what appears to be a deposition where Gooding admits to the conduct. That's according to Deadline.com. Uh, so why are all of these people suddenly being um, trapped in these lawsuits? Why are all these people suddenly being um, 
sued for sexual misconduct. It's a it's an important question to ask. Now, the, the simple answer, the most direct answer I can give you is uh, what I think uh, many of us should know at this point. If you don't, you're going to know it by Friday. It's called the New York Adult Survivors Act. It's the Adult Survivors Act. It's a law that went into effect uh, last November. And it says that if you are a survivor, an adult survivor of sexual abuse, you have the right to sue your uh, abuser in New York. Uh, even if it's beyond what would normally be the statute of limitations. So even if the statute of limitations has has passed, you can still sue. That is a legal fact. That uh, window, that bonus window of one year started last November, and it ends, guess when? November 24th, 24, excuse me, 48 hours from now, Friday. But in a way, it is like 24 hours. Why? Because tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So the reason you see Bill Cosby being sued and and, and and Jamie Foxx being sued and Cuba Gooding Jr. being sued and, and Jimmy Iovine being sued and Harvey Pierre being sued and Axl Rose being sued. And there will be more. I guarantee you there will be more. The reason you keep seeing that is because the deadline's almost up. Now, some of these uh, people have the same attorneys. Uh, the, the attorneys who represented Cassie also represent other people who we've just named. So that's another thing that speaks and I'm not saying that to cast any aspersions or to, sh or, to, or, to, or to shed any doubt over the legitimacy of the claim. I'm only saying that to say that part of what you're seeing is, is a very strategic and coordinated legal tactic uh, to, to, to make sure that these cases come out at certain points. Um, so part of it is the Adult Survivors Act. This is the last chance to make these claims for a lot of the survivors, a lot of these alleged uh, victims. Uh, another reason I'm arguing is because we've seen this succeed for Cassie. Cassie came out. She attempted to solve it behind the scenes, according to sources. It didn't work. The case went public. She filed a 35 page document with lots of stuff. Whole bunch of celebrities weighed in. The peanut gallery was loud. It wasn't a good look. And they settled. We don't know how much I've heard eight figures. I've heard nine figures. I don't know the amount. I'm not going to speculate on the amount, but we know it was at least enough to make everybody happy on Cassie's side. So now, as these suits are being filed, and these are civil suits, these, these people are not facing criminal prosecution. They're facing civil liability. That means money. They These people who are facing civil liability, of course, they don't want to be dragged through the mud. They don't want embarrassment. What we've seen already is probably more embarrassment than they want. Now, some of these cases may go to court and a jury will, will, will make a decision. There'll be an adjudication through the jury. But um, a lot of these cases are going to be settled out of court because people don't want more drama. They don't want their name muddied. And so, you know, Cassie being successful probably made other people who may have been reluctant to come forward to come forward. I'm not just talking about celebrities here. Again, celebrities ain't the only people who are going to be uh, receiving paperwork uh, because of sexual misconduct, allegedly. They're just the ones that are going to be on the front page. They're just the ones whose stories are going to get told the most. Um, so in that context, it's important to, to understand sort of what the time constraints are, what the deadlines are, what the law allows for, um, and also what the court of public opinion will help advance. Now, there's another piece to this though, right? Um, there's lots of pieces to this actually. Um, that is the public reaction. There are cases, there are individuals, there are people who, um, we look at it and we go, I don't see it. There are other people who you look at and you say, yeah, it might be true. Now, nobody should be judged in a court of public opinion. Nobody should have a determination made about their fate based on how the world reads them. That ain't never worked out for black folk. Definitely ain't worked out for black men. But, if you're Axl Rose and you have a reputation for 
all kinds of awful things, you probably are going to be pressured to settle in a different way. If you're Cuba Gooding Jr. and you got multiple cases, or you're Bill Cosby and you got a, 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 a mountain of cases, old and current, between the two, you know you ain't going to win. Now, Bill Cosby might fight this on what he calls principle, but at the end of the day, it's probably not going to play well. So this also does not help. Again, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and leave comments. Let me know what you think. Are these cases okay? Are you, are you, are you, are you frustrated with these cases? Are you excited by these cases? Are you energized by these cases? I'll tell you what I think. I think that for so long, we have lived in a moment where women in particular, but all victims of sexual, of sexual violence, sexual assault, have been unable to tell their stories. They've been unable to uh, articulate their pain without being viewed with skepticism or dismissal. For a long time, women couldn't talk about sexual assault, especially if it, if it was uh, intimate partner kind of stuff like your boyfriend or your husband does it, which was Cassie's allegation, right? Um, if it's uh, a date, you know, there are all these kind of circumstances where women didn't feel safe because the world would say, who are you? Why are you this way? Why did you dress this way? Why did you show up into his house that way? What were your intentions? Who's your sexual, what is your sexual history? Who are your sexual partners? These kinds of questions have dissuaded victims from coming forward. And it's not just women. I remember being a professor at Morehouse and seeing uh, a young man who, who, who sat on the steps of the library on a mattress for weeks at a time to talk about the sexual violence he had experienced at the hands of another male student. But again, because there's so much shame around sexual identity, because there's so much denial about rape culture, they didn't even want that to come out and be part of the conversation. And so it became very messy. This is all part of the equation. So there's that. Now, when Cassie came out, there were a lot of people in the world who said, why is she just coming out now? I'm not just talking about the celebrities that did it, although some celebrities did it. I heard Slim, Slim Thug say, you know, if you've been abused, you need to say something right away or else forget about it. He kind of backtracked a little bit. I think people got him to understand that that ain't the right <laughs> position to date. Uh, I think some survivors spoke up. Um, Peter Guns said something very similar, or they didn't say similar. He, he, they talked about being a cash grab. Rich Dollars, from uh, both from Love and Hip Hop franchise and also former music execs, said that this was a cash grab. We've seen this from lots of people saying that. And so there's two things that I want to say about that. The first thing is, if someone has harmed you, sometimes cash is okay. It doesn't make the pain go away. It doesn't fix the problem. But neither does putting someone in a cage. So for some people, you know, who have been harmed and discarded, you know, money might be the way to get therapy. Money might be the way to keep your life whole after the person left you, after you stopped wanting or, or, or after you no longer put up with the abuse. There's lots of ways where money might actually be a restorative or just outcome. Locking someone in a cage may or may not be. And also, there's plenty of reason to believe that the criminal legal system is not going to produce justice for sexual assault survivors. Why? Because they usually don't. So I'm not convinced that a cash grab is inherently wrong. But then there's the other thing of well, why are you just speaking up now? Why are you just saying something now? The Adult Survivors Act, Survivors Law, was made precisely um, out of recognition that it often takes months, years, decades to come forward and speak out about your abuse. There are children who have been sexually abused who don't realize it until 30 or 40 years later. There's also a Children's Survivors Act as well. Um, there are people who recognize that they're being sexually harassed or sexually abused. And um, we're afraid to come forward. They're afraid to come forward because the person might be physically powerful or dangerous to them. They're afraid literally to speak out because they don't want to get killed. 
the person may have influence over their life. They may be a boss. They may be a power broker. If they're being exploited in um, uh, an industry where there's a concentration of power, for example, uh, again, I'm, I'm not saying that Harvey Pierre did this. I don't know anything about Harvey Pierre's case. What I know for sure, other than what the, the actual lawsuit says, but what we know from the lawsuit is that this person was a young uh, upstart in a business where he is an industry exec. And so if this person is telling the truth, if this person was harmed, um, then you could see why somebody might not want to speak out when it could affect their whole career forever. This was Cassie's argument, right? She didn't want to speak out because she was worried that something would happen to her to end her career forever. These are the kinds of concerns. These are the types of fears that people have in this. So we can't be surprised when we see this. How many people have been molested or sexually harmed otherwise by a, a priest or a pastor uh, where they not only had the power dynamic, um, they also had doubts, self-doubt. They also said people won't believe me. Um, they also said, I feel guilt and shame. I don't want to bring the pastor down. I don't want to bring the teacher down. Can y'all hear me? I'm pausing just for a second because I'm, I'm getting a notice. Y'all with me? Okay. Person will say, well, look, I don't want to bring my pastor down. I don't want to bring my... Um, priest down. I don't want to bring the teacher down. I don't want to bring the star football coach down thinking about Penn State, Jerry Sandusky. I don't want to be responsible for that. Then there's the race dynamics, right? Black women say, I don't want to bring this black man down even though he raped me. I don't want to bring this black man down even though he harmed me. It becomes part of the mix. We had another case. It was announced maybe an hour ago that Marcellus Wiley, Marcellus Wiley, uh, former NFL defensive uh, defensive end, right? Former NFL defensive end um, says, or what it is said that um, he's accused of raping a fellow student when he was at Columbia University 30 years ago. She, this woman says that in the fall of 1994, when he was a sophomore and a star running back at Columbia University, uh, that he raped her in a dorm room. In a dorm room. Marcus Wiley denies the charges. Marcus Wiley says didn't happen. He says it's complete BS. Um, again, they'll have their day in court or they won't. They'll settle it. I don't know. But whatever happens, again, it's another person. So you got a black person at Columbia University, another black person at Columbia University who's a star football player. You could also understand how somebody internally to the black community might say, I don't want to take this black man and ruin his life. I don't want to embarrass the one black football player on the team. Again, I'm not saying Marcel Wiley is innocent or guilty. That's not my point. My point is, is that there is a dynamic here. There is a process here where people have lots of reasons, both internally imposed and externally imposed, um, that make them less likely to speak up or speak out about their about sexual violence. I can tell you, as someone who uh, has multiple friends who have... Uh, levied allegations against Russell Simmons. Uh, they've told me their stories. They've told me what happened. And they've told me why they were afraid to speak out sooner. I don't presume that they're lying because they took a long time to tell. I understand why they took a long time to tell. I understand why they were afraid. And so um, these are the dynamics that we have to think about. And it's not just about race. Again, Jimmy Iovine, Axel Rose, these are white men. So these, these, these uh, cases that are coming out, these uh, allegations that are coming forward, these are coming forward for white men, black men, or people across the board. I think if anything, what you're gonna see is people in power are going to be uh, the targets of Lots of stuff over the next 48 hours. By the way, family, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and please hit the join button if you're going to be part of the MLH fam. And this is the kind of conversation we're going to have. It's going to be politics, everything from the Middle East to 
uh, to black to, to black culture, to pop music, to to sexual violence and Me Too in the United States. There are a lot of people who believe that you know the Me Too moment, the reckoning with sexual violence in this country that happened five years ago, eight years ago, whatever it was now, was a passing thing. Um, people saw it as a witch hunt. I'm going to get Me Tooed. Um, that's been the wrong way to think about this. The proper way to think about this, I believe, is that people who had no accountability for sexual misconduct um, were held accountable. And while the spotlight and the attention is no longer exclusively on that matter anymore, we cannot afford to return to the previous days. We cannot afford to return to old boys networks and old boys clubs. We cannot afford to return to the days where a, a, a woman uh, works at a job and just has to assume that she's going to be sexually harassed or that we just accept as a norm that you're going to have to have sex on the Hollywood casting couch in order to be a successful producer or actor or actress. We can't return uh, to a moment where we sort of laugh off that if you go to jail, you're going to get sexually assaulted. These are these are the conditions that we've had to wrestle with forever in this country, in this world. Women have never been safe. Um, and other there are other groups who also haven't been safe, but women absolutely have never been safe. And as we see these allegations come out, again, my, my interest is not in the the, the specifics of the cases or the gossip of the cases. That's why I say, like, I'm not going to get into the muck and mire of each person's case. My point is, how are we as a community, how are we as a nation responding to these allegations? We can't just look at the Cassie Diddy thing or the Bill Cosby thing as an outlier or as an interruption or as a juicy piece of gossip. No, we have to look at this as a symptom of a bigger problem in this country, which is that we still have systematically denied uh, safe spaces to lots of populations, but particularly to women. The fact that people are coming out and courageously saying, this happened to me last year, last month, last decade, college, whenever, the fact that people are courageously speaking up about that, and many people's primary reaction is not, how was this person harmed and how can we make them whole again? But instead, up, oh, you missed your deadline. Why'd you wait so long? Why'd you take so long? If we knew, if we knew that the person was telling the truth. Would we feel differently about statutes of limitations and deadlines? Some people would, some people wouldn't. But if you would feel differently, if you knew the person was really harmed, then why don't we spend our energy finding out if the person was harmed rather than trying to dismiss the claim out of hand because we feel like it took too long. Again, there are lots of reasons why it takes too long. There are people I know right now, people in my life, friends I'm talking about, colleagues I'm talking about, who have been harmed, who have been assaulted, who have never spoken up or spoken out about it, not because they can't prove it, not because they're uh, shaky with their story, but because they don't want the fallout, the internal fallout, the psychological unrest, the public scrutiny, the embarrassment. That's why you see so many Jane Doe's uh, coming forward in these documents is because they don't want the world to be telling them what they did wrong when they themselves are identifying as the victim. This is the work, y'all. So over the next 48 hours, look, it's, it's, it's Wednesday, November 22nd at 1123 p.m. on the East Coast. That means we got 48 hours and 37 minutes for these cases to get filed. I guarantee you there will be more cases. I guarantee you there will be more lawsuits. And this is all just for New York. Imagine if, if this were opened up to the whole country. Imagine if this were a federal piece of legislation. Imagine if people could do this in every city, not just New York, but LA and Chicago and Detroit and Watts and Philadelphia and Houston and New Orleans and Spokane and Boise and Des Moines and right. If, if, if and Mount Pelier, if it was all everywhere, I'm, I'm saying those different places to, to do different geographies, class and race dynamics. Um, um, I'll look for it in one second. Um, um, oh, I see it now. Um, how do we move forward 
with principles? How do we move forward having learned the proper lessons from the Me Too era, which again, I say we're still in and we should always be in. Because to me, the Me Too era simply means that we acknowledge the legitimacy of the victims we and, and their pain and their stories. It means that we acknowledge the legitimacy of our past. It doesn't mean though, let's be honest, it doesn't mean that we have to accept everybody's claim as true. It doesn't mean that we ignore the long and deep history of, 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 of black people's bodies and particularly black men's bodies being seen as sites of sexual violence and predation a priori, right? Before any investigation, we don't have to assume that every black man is guilty. We, we can't presume that nobody's lying, but we do have to look at the evidence and the data, which shows quite conclusively that most people who make accusations of rape aren't lying. An infinitesimal number of people who say they are uh, sexually assaulted or raped in particular are lying, right? I believe women, I, I trust the stories. It doesn't mean though that we don't ask critical questions. It doesn't mean that we presume that nobody's ever not telling the truth. It doesn't mean that we just we we just get rid of uh, a, a criminal legal system or we just get rid of due process. But what it does mean is that we don't begin from a premise that victims are lying, that survivors did something wrong. We don't begin from a premise of assuming that a woman who says she was sexually uh, violated somehow has an angle. Instead, we begin from the premise of saying, who was harmed and how do we make them whole again? That has to be our disposition. And this moment right here is the opportunity for another reckoning. It's the opportunity for us to do this right this time. And doing it right means we listen to these cases. We look for the truth. We have a different national conversation. We shift the discourse away from talking about criticizing these women. We shift the discourse away from saying, why did it take so long? And instead we ask ourselves, um, uh, what were the situations, what were the conditions that have allowed this thing to happen and allowed it to persist for so long? We got a super chat coming in uh, from uh, Norden Red 1984. Moving the conversation forward, how do we make changes uh, to culture to make sexual violence against women less prevalent? I think one, and thank you for that wonderful question. Um, I think for, for, for one, we need to um, acknowledge that we have a culture of sexual violence. That means that we need to examine our television shows, our movies, we need to, uh, our jokes, uh, our, our visual art, every aspect of our world, we need to examine critically and say, how does this reinforce or normalize sexual violence? You could watch, I'll give you an example. You could watch a Medea movie, a Tyler Perry movie, and this is no shade to Tyler Perry. I actually enjoy Tyler Perry movies, even despite all the criticisms, right? Pop Tyler Perry movie will be made for a church audience. There won't be any cussing or very little cussing, definitely no F-bombs. There won't be any sex. It's implicit, but it ain't visible because it's a PG rated movie, maybe PG-13, but no more than PG-13, often PG. And in that same vein, a character will be going to jail and Medea will say, don't drop the soap. For those that don't know, if you're not in the United States context, don't drop the soap is suggesting that if you were to go to prison, that you are constantly vulnerable to sexual violence. That if you were to drop the soap when you go to pick it up, you could be sexually assaulted. That's the idea. How does a PG movie have that as a joke? Why does a PG movie have that as a joke? The answer is because we live in a society, we live in a world that normalizes sexual violence. We normalize sexual violence abuse. We normalize harm that happens. In jail, we normalize sexual abuse uh, and, cons and, and all kinds of unconsensual bonds uh, with men, to men, particularly queer men. We assume in many ways that if you're trans, you're going to be sexually assaulted. And the, the data bears that out, sadly. We do nothing about it. We presume uh, culturally that, you know, women who, who go to a nightclub and go home with a guy or who go to answer a phone call at 3 a.m. It has to be a booty call, regardless of whether they want it or not. The idea that you can't revoke consent, the idea of stealthing, where you take the condom off and the person's not looking. All of these things are acts that we have normalized in our culture, that we joke about, that we talk about, that we, that we, don't, that, that we, that we fail to critically unpack. And in doing so, we normalize um, sexual violence. So to make the changes to move forward, uh, not in red, we have to... Uh, we have to find a different way. We have to have those conversations. We have to call those things out. We have to point out 
uh, something on television that's wrong. We have to point out something that's in the film that's wrong. We have to point out how a billboard uh, reflects an image that reinforces something violent or unhealthy. We have to do that. Um, we have to shift the unit of analysis. Um, the way to avoid being raped after getting drunk is not for women to figure out. It's for men to figure out how not to rape people when they're drunk, right? Shift the unit of analysis. When you get pulled over by police, when black people get pulled over by police on the highway, the problem isn't driving while black, as we call it. The problem is patrolling while racist. Similarly, women or other people who are uh, subjected to various forms of sexual violence, they should not be the, they, they should, it's, it is not up to them to have to decide how to stay safe. It is up to men to decide. It is up to the powerful to decide. It is up to people in positions of strength, physical strength and uh, professional strength and power, economic strength and power, uh, media strength, and all those things. It's up for them to figure out how not to be harmful. It's up to them to figure out how not to be harmful. And that's what we have to do. Yo, I appreciate you. I appreciate uh, this This uh, super, super thanks as well. Uh, Heidi. I appreciate you too. Thank you so much, Shukran uh, Katir. Kenna, um, thank you for joining the MLH fam. It's always good to have new members. Uh, I love that, yo. Everybody, the next 48 hours are gonna be wild. You're gonna see all kinds of conversations. You're gonna see all kinds of victim blaming. You're gonna see all kinds of rape apologists. You're gonna see a very disgusting, disturbing uh, set of conversations. And you'll also see some signs of hope. You'll see people who are standing up for victims like they never have before. You'll see people who are advocating like they've never done before. This isn't all bad news, but it's going to be a messy 48 hours. And I don't mean in a gossipy way. I mean, in a sense of it'll tell us where we are in this country with regard to sexual violence. It'll also tell you where we are not when it comes to sexual violence. So let's have that conversation. Let's be real about it. Let's be honest about it. Let's do our best, yo. Family, I'm going to see y'all later. Um, we'll be, I'll be back on later tonight to talk about uh, Rashida Tlaib and uh, Hill Harper and this APAC uh, donation stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, man, we got to have these conversations even when they're difficult. Dr. Q, thank you so much for the super sticker. I'm so grateful. You have no idea. Everybody hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, uh, hit the join button. We're building a platform here of independent political education, individual, independent radical education. I'm creating a platform not to do more TV. I do TV on the Grio. You can catch me every day. You can catch me every week on uh, Al Jazeera. You can catch me uh, uh, on BET uh, for, for Black and America and Black, excuse me. You can catch me in all those places. But the thing that I want to do on this YouTube channel is not to do more TV, not to do more traditional media, but to do what we just did, to spend 45 minutes unpacking these cases, not to get into gossip, but to talk about how we can get free how we can better protect ourselves, how we can better love each other and 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 ourselves. Um, let's have that conversation. And I'll see y'all back here in about 15 minutes. All right, y'all. Peace.